John chapter 2, verse number 1. When you've got it, say, I've got it. It should be on the screen. <laughs> I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, to all of our first-time guests in the room, thank you so much for being here. Um, come back next week, okay, to see the pastor uh, of the church. I'm going to do what I can, and he'll fix anything that I mess up. Uh, hey, real quick, we're living in crazy times. I don't know if you know it. Um, the world is getting crazy. Um, but as Christians, we don't panic when the world gets crazy. We pray. In fact, the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and post and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. Your first response should be to pray. Can I challenge you to make that your first response? Let's, let's, let's just center our hearts and pray for the country, pray for our neighborhoods, pray for our marriages, pray for our children, that God would be glorified in everything. Y'all got John chapter 2? I hope you do. I, I talked so you can get it. <laughs> let's go to verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I want to pause parenthetically and talk to some of the children that snuck into the room. You can only be the son of God and get away with calling your mother woman. And if Mary was anything like my mama, she would have said, I will send you back to your daddy if you call me woman one more time. <laughs> His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there was set there are six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. I want to preach for the next two hours if you'll let me. And even if you do, Pastor Brian wouldn't let me. Um, I want to preach from this thought, the conundrum of purpose. Elbow your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know what conundrum means. But I'm real interested in purpose. Matter of fact, elbow the other neighbor and say, other neighbor, you don't know either. But I'm real interested in purpose. Listen, let's pray. It'll be a very long prayer. I'm Pentecostal. We like to pray. So let's, let's pray. Very long prayer. Father, speak. We are listening. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Just shout it at me one more time because y'all sound so good. The conundrum of purpose. So I want to start today's talk off with a game. Uh, and the game is called, I Was Today Years Old. Now, there are some people in the room that know about this game, but then there are those of you in the room who are like, what does that even mean? Today years old means you've been looking or doing something your whole life, and then all of a sudden somebody gives you some new information. It's like, that can't be true. It is impossible for that to be true because I never did it that way my whole life. So hear me. Keep your salvation when we play this game, because I'm about to rock some of y'all's world. Picture number one. <sighs> if you know what this is, you had an incredible childhood. Let me just, <laughs> let me just. These things were the bomb.com. They don't have a flavor 
The flavor is the color. I want the blue, I want the red. I didn't really do the purple. It tastes like medicine. <laughs> but the problem is, y'all see the thing at the top? That, that little thing right up there. I'm from Texas, so what we would do is we would peel it off and we would either chew it or we would throw it at somebody. Sound like we grew up in the same place. Yeah, okay, take a deep breath. That's not what that's for. You actually rip that thing off, drink your drink, turn that little tab over, and put it in the hole to close your drink up. Exactly. Exactly. Y'all are like, ain't no way possible. This thing was a rocket launcher. No, it is a top that closes the drink. Picture number two. Y'all know what that is? It's a little thing at the house that's on the, on the door and you kick it, it goes. Some, some of us just used to sit there all day long because we didn't have Xbox and PlayStation and tablets and all kinds of such. That was our entertainment. That and singing into the fan, but we won't go there. And drinking water out of a hose. This is why, this is why you know, we, our generation, we was just built just a little bit different. I think it was the minerals of the hose. It just, it just did something. This is to stop the door from hitting the wall, right? Partially. If you bend that little device down and push the door all the way back, the door goes over that, and then once you let it go, it actually holds the door in place. Yeah. I know. I know. Okay. This last one, some of y'all are going to have to go to Freedom Conference because I'm about to deal with your past. Okay? I got, I got, we got to deal with your past. We, if you're in my generation, we all grew up with it. Just throw the last one on the screen. I grew up hood adjacent. Not all the way in the hood, but I was close enough. You know, someone don't push me because I'm. Stop, 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 please. Y'all gonna get me in trouble. So, everybody in the hood and hood adjacent knows that this little area down here. That's for the storage of the extra pans. Or so we were told. That's really an extra space to keep your food warm while you are cooking. And everybody that's saying, no it's not, this is why your pans are rusting out because it's heated under there and your pans are not supposed to be stored. And y'all are mad at me because I just presented you with a conundrum because this is not what I was told. And the conundrum of purpose is I did one thing one way for so long and my world was rocked upside down when I found out new information. And while we are laughing at the pictures on the screen, some of this, this is your life. You've been doing it one way for so long and then life presented you with new information and now you are in a conundrum. We've got a problem. And the problem is when you don't know the purpose of a thing, hear me, abuse and misuse are inevitable. Some of you have abused and misused seasons because you did not know their purpose. Some of you have abused and misused relationships because you did not know their purpose. Some of you have abused and misused your gifts because you did not know the purpose for which you had them. And so the question we have to ask is what is purpose? 
I like to describe it like this or define it like this. Purpose is the unlocking of God's why for our lives. Write that down because people who take notes and sit in overflow go get to heaven faster. <laughs> Purpose is the unlocking of God's why for our life. Let's go to Jeremiah 29 and 11. It says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for welfare and not evil. To give you a future and to hope. Can I break it down very simply? If God's got a plan, you've still got purpose. I don't know who I came to preach to in Charlotte, but I need to encourage somebody that God still has your future on his mind. And it would be crazy for you to give up now. It would be crazy for you to throw in the towel. Because if God still has a plan, I've still got a purpose. Isn't it interesting that um, in life, we don't treat our life like we treat our things. I, I, I happen to be um, a part of the team of saints that will make it into heaven. I'm Team Apple. <laughs> Can I tell you why I can't be Team Android? It's too close to Antichrist. I don't like it. It's Android, Antichrist. I just, I can't do it. If my iPhone starts acting crazy, which it does every time they get ready to drop a new one, these things just lose their mind. I don't take my phone to the dentist. I take my phone to Apple. If my car breaks down, I don't take my car to the surgery just because they can operate on things. I take my car to the dealer because they were the manufacturers. But what I found is we will take our material things to other pe people that specialize in fixing it, but never take our lives to the one who created it. You will post before you pray. You will tweet before you talk to God. And God is saying, I'm the one that created you. Why are you running to other people who don't know your purpose. I told you I grew up hood adjacent, so um, when, when I was a kid, I had a drug problem. And uh, I, I know some people are sympathetic to me in the room, but please don't be. Uh, because my drug problem is, is I was drugged to every church service <laughs> that ever existed. Why were you drunk to every church service? Because my second problem was is I'm, I'm a pastor's kid. Please pray for the pastor's children. We don't get a break. And, and, and because I'm third generation pastor's kid, uh, I, I have another problem. I see messages in everything. I can pull a message out of anything, especially movies. Good Lord, that's why At The Movies is one of my favorite series because I like to tie in how movies connect to God. I like to tie in how Simba was, was saying, I can't wait to be king. And he thought that he was just singing a simple song. But what he was actually doing was prophesying his father's death because the only way he could be king was Mufasa had to die come back in October. <laughs> Y'all see what I did there? <laughs> Every good movie has to have somebody tell the story. It was Ahmad telling the story in Soul Food. It was Carrie Bradshaw telling the story in, don't say it out loud, we got children in the room. <laughs> Somebody's got to tell the story. I, I, this happens to me, it's such a chronic thing that my wife has gotten used to the look. I get this that's so raven look <laughs> when I get hit by a word. You, you know the look, it's the... <laughs> and she's like, it just happened, didn't I? I'm like, yeah, buddy. And, and I was reading John chapter 2, and I realized, wait, I just got dropped in the middle of a movie. John chapter 2 drops us in the middle of a party. We don't even get the lead up of the wedding. We are right in the middle of the party and the wine has run out. And I said, huh, 
is this a lifetime or a Tyler Perry? <laughs> because only one's going to make it out alive. Somebody's got to die in Tyler's movies. I don't know what Tyler is doing, but my God, these movies are getting crazy. And they run out of wine at this wedding, and I'm like, oh, this is a conundrum. I'm trying to get y'all to use this word in your everyday vocabulary by the time you leave here. This is a conundrum. Because they've run out of wine in a time where it wasn't like American weddings. Y'all know American weddings, we show up for one day, um, everybody get their food, we're going to Cupid shuffle and cha-cha slide, and we're going to be good, we're going to be out of there because, you know, it's only one day. No, at this time, they partied for seven days. And the wine had to last for seven whole business days. Now, we get married for love. They got married for power. And so this was actually more of a contract between two families to come together than it was a union of love. No, no, no. An actual contract was drawn up detailing the financial responsibilities of every party associated with the wedding. And the groom was responsible for the party. And he, like many other innocent husbands, <laughs> did not properly prepare to fill the wine cellar for us to last seven days. Now, I know how my wife gets when I forget Chick-fil-A sauce. You forget the wine that needs to last us for seven days? Can I put pressure on a moment? Anybody that was a part of the wedding felt the significance of this moment. Because if the party didn't go right, not the ceremony, the party, the marriage would be branded as a disgrace. The host family would carry with them a stigma of shame for generations. Hear me. And anybody associated with working at that wedding would not be permitted to work in that community again. This was a big deal. And they ran out of wine. I have to ask this question. What do you do? When the thing that brought you the most joy, you run out of. How do you handle when what you needed to sustain finally runs out? And it is in this moment, my friends, that the first place of purpose is revealed because purpose is often found in the deficit. Purpose. It's found in the deficit. Overflow, write that down. Purpose is found in the deficit. When you are in a deficit, deficiency, hear me, unlocks new levels of creativity. When you don't have what you need to get done, what you need to get done, you will find a way to create something that will produce the outcome that you need. I grew up hood adjacent, I told you this. So my mama, single mother, she knew that we had to eat every day. But sometimes we had more month than we had money. And so when she would sense a moment like this coming up, I thought that she thought that our favorite meal was spaghetti. <laughs> and even though it was good, I'm like, we don't have to eat it all the time. But what I now know when I got older was my mom had to get the biggest pot that she could find, fill it up with water, put the spaghettis in the pot, and make enough for us to eat because she had to find a way to sustain us in the deficit. Can I tell you 
that there are those of you in this room and are sitting in overflow. Your life has been operating at a deficit and you've been trying to figure out, God, what am I going to do to get out of this situation? Let me prophesy. God is about to give you a creative idea. He's about to give you an invention that will feed your entire family as you get through the deficit. Let me prophesy. The deficit of the moment is the platform for the purposes of God. We are in a moment of a conundrum because the wine has run out. And the groom is panicking. Psalm 27 says, I will remain confident of what? Seeing the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living can I prophesy again? You thought you would die in your situation. You thought you would die exactly where you are. But I came to tell somebody in Charlotte, North Carolina, that you are going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You might as well cancel the funeral because God is saying, before you die, I'm going to show up. And sometimes, hear me, God lets things run out before he runs in. Why does he do that? Because sometimes the things in our life have taken up too much space and he has no room to move. The wine has run out. All of the people are gathered at the party. The ceremony is over. They've had the big kiss. The cha-cha slide has played twice now. And the party is now interrupted because the wine has run out. I mean, the moment of purification has happened. And now we have no wine. God bless you. That's a double portion. Sometimes, you know what I found out? Purpose is not only found in the deficit. Purpose is also found in desperation. When you are desperate and your back is against the wall, it will push you to do something that you have not done before. They tell you not to fight desperate people because when they don't have a reason to live, they will take you out as well as themselves. And the enemy thought that because you are in a backed up against the wall situation that you would give up. But what he messed up was he didn't know that there was still more fight in you. He didn't know that there was still more in you that would shake if the moment needed it. Here we are at the party, and uh, Mary is desperate because according to some theologians, the only reason Jesus and Mary were at the party is because they probably would, put, would have been related to the groom. So Jesus, being attached to this people, he would have walked with a stigma of shame. So Mary turns to Jesus and said, hey, they have no wine. I need you to fix something. I've got a problem with this because nowhere in Scripture does it ever tell us that Jesus was a sommelier. I know you don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that Jesus ever studied wine. Nowhere in Scripture does it ever tell us that Jesus spent any time in the vineyard. As a matter of fact, can I message your theology? He wasn't even the water walking Jesus. He wasn't the blinded eyes opening Jesus. He wasn't the raised Lazarus back to life Jesus, even though he did all of those things. But right now, he's just Jesus, Mary's son, the carpenter's boy. And this is why you've got to be careful about the people that you're connected to overlooking them because you don't see the hand of God on their life. 
In a moment of desperation, Mary says, Jesus, I need you to turn this water into wine. And he says, my hour has not yet come. Desperation will cause you to push past things because I need God to do something right now. The deficit of the moment caused Mary to go to Jesus, but the desperation of the moment caused Mary to bypass him. You ever had to bypass Jesus? She looks at his friends and says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Why? Because Mary looks at Jesus as the walking embodiment of God being able to work miracles. You missed what I just said. Because of the experience that she had with Jesus outside of what anybody else could see on him, she knew this boy is a miracle. And if he's a miracle, he can work a miracle. All I've got to do is get to Jesus. She says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And while... It would have been fun to just preach that you're going from deficit to destiny. While my preference would have been to preach that you're about to recover all. And yeah, I could have. I'm Pentecostal, sorry. While we could have went there, I believe it would have done the moment of disservice. Because all of that is obvious. What I found is purpose isn't often found in the obvious. Purpose sometimes is lying in the obscure. And it's the thing that we were not looking for that purpose finally reveals itself. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20 says, And suddenly, a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. And she said to herself, she didn't get it off of a YouTube video. She didn't hear it in a sermon. She said to herself, it would be obvious for me to go home, but the desperate thing I need to do right now is touch the hem of his garment because if I could touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Can I tell you, sometimes the miracle that you've been waiting on is found in the presence of God and he's just trying to see, will you be desperate enough to reach out and touch me because it's not obvious what's going to happen. Because sometimes purpose is found in the demonstration. Sometimes you got to do something to get something. What if God is waiting on you to do something before you get something? Pastor Bryant says it like this. Before you can get your D.O. season, you have to, you have, before you can get your D.U.E. season, you have to do your D.O. season. And God is waiting on you to do something in overflow. He's waiting on you to do something at the back of the room. Because it is in that place that purpose is revealed. And I've been in church my whole life and I never knew that the conundrum of the moment actually lay in six stone water pots that were there for the moment of purification. They weren't even supposed to be a part of this moment. But when you're in the presence of Jesus, sometimes he will snatch you off of the sideline and drop you right in the middle of a moment because he needs your participation in this miracle. I think we might have a water pot here. There we go. Can we give it up for the disciple? It's sliding. Sometimes it's not easy to carry what God is calling you to carry. Jesus says three things that I want to prophesy to you. Number one, he says, fill it to the brim. Anybody ever had Jesus answer a prayer 
with an answer that didn't look like it fit the situation? He says, fill the water pots to the brim. I feel like in this moment, it's like watching Steve Urkel. He says, shh, not while I'm boring. (laughs) Because sometimes you can't have everybody speak into what God is doing in your life. Fill them to the brim. This moment is prophetic because what he's actually saying is leave no room for uncertainty. And I came to talk to some water pots this morning who feel like God just snatched you off the sideline. And you don't feel qualified or equipped to handle what he's asking you to do. Here's this prophetic word. Fill them to the brim. Pastor Brian just preached last week, stop running on E. I came to reaffirm that word, stop running on empty. By the time you leave out of this room this morning, here's my prayer, that you would be filled to the brim. I came to prophesy to somebody that your days of running on empty are over. God is about to fill you to the brim. Second thing he says is draw out the water. Now it's getting good because I know it's just water. Jesus knows it's just water. The disciples know it's just water. The water pots know it's just water. And some of you in this room, you feel like the water pots in this situation because what's inside of you doesn't match what God is calling you to. But can I tell you that what God is saying is I want to use the thing that I placed in you that you didn't even know was there. You thought that you were made for one thing, but in a moment of desperation, in a moment of deficiency, because you decided to get into my presence, I'm about to do something in you that the world was not aware of. I'm about to do something in you that your family didn't see. I'm about to do something in you that your spouse didn't see. I'm about to do something in you that your co-worker didn't see. There is more in you. It says draw out the water. I'm afraid because the whole party depends on what's in this. And some of you in this room, your whole family depends on what's in you. Some of you in this room, your friends depend on what's inside of you. And you're like, God, I don't know if I have what it takes. But because you made yourself available, because sometimes the best ability is availability. Because you made yourself available to be used in the presence of God. I feel his spirit now. Because you made yourself available to be used, by the time he turns you over, what was in you begins to get stirred and there is something that has now shifted from what people thought was in you. I came to prophesy to somebody that God had already predetermined that you were created for this moment. I just needed you to be ready to shift. I needed you to be ready to be turned. I needed you to be available to be used. Some of you are water pots in this room because your assignment does not match your qualifications. Some of you have had to carry moments while feeling like an imposter. But I came to snatch you out of complacency this morning. I came to grab you by your collar and pull you into the moment why because god's ready to do a miracle god's ready to open a door god is ready to supply the thing that your family has been praying about god is ready to do the thing that's been on your heart but you gotta be available
some of you, your assignment has been, I'm the strong one of the family. So I can't break down. Some of you, your assignment has been, I'm the only one that cares about this marriage. So I can't get off my knees. But hear the spirit of the Lord. The real conundrum. Woo! I just felt a shift in the room. The real conundrum is the enemy thought that you would stay right there. But God had a, had a water pot sitting on the sideline. And he said, I'm about to turn. I'm about to turn it around. I'm about to shift something. I'm about to change something. I'm about to break something. Is there anybody in this room that would throw your hands up and say, God, you can do it in me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I've got to shift some people in this room. There are some of you who, sh who thought you were just showing up just so you can sit in overflow. You got in your car and put that premium gas in there and now you debated going back home because I couldn't get in the room. But just because you couldn't get in the room don't mean you're not in his presence. And God can shift you right where you are. And there's somebody at the back of the room that just says, I want to sit in the dark. I don't want anybody to see me because I don't feel qualified to be in a room like this. Can I tell you, you messed up. You thought you were just coming to a service. What you were actually coming to was a shift. And God is saying, I've got to change some things about you. You're in the right place at the right time. And by the time you get home, there is going to be something different on the inside of you. Who am I talking to? In the union, Charlotte, God say, I'm about to shift it. Some of you had no plans of getting baptized. Can I tell you that now is your moment? Because by the time you go down in the water, whoo, when you come back up, there's going to be something that shifts on the inside of you. Some of you, I've got to shift you into your next step. You didn't know that you needed a Union Charlotte and you've been playing around and dating Union Charlotte. But God is saying, now I need you in growth track step two because I've got to show you how to discover your design so you know what your purpose is. And you're going to walk out into this room and say, where is the growth track room? Because something in me has just shifted. Some of you are in this room and you're saying, I just wanted to show up to hear a good word and go home. But God is saying, you showed up because we needed to have a conversation. Because you've lost your trust in me. And I've got to shift some people from being broken to believing that he still can. So with every head bow, every eye closed, I need you to repeat this after me. If it's your first time, say it with all you've got. If it's your last time, I need you to say it with all you've got. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, today I say yes to your grace. I say yes to your salvation. I'm here in the moment available for you to use. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and got up three days later and because of that the same power that got him on the grave gave me access to salvation and from today forward my life is in your hands in Jesus name amen church I need you to jump on your feet give God the greatest shout that you can if you know that he's shifting something if you know that he's changing something if you know that he's breaking something